Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Building Your Permaculture Property podcast. Uh, on this episode, I have the amazing Nicole Masters, uh, soil health guru extraordinaire with me. And I am, uh, <laughs> I am absolutely thrilled to, um, to be doing this podcast. Um, we had Nicole out to our farm, what, it would have been three, four years ago? Yeah, it just feels like with 2020, a lifetime ago, but yeah, yeah. it's probably four years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of, fun. Yeah. and uh, and and since then, I mean, I I I got I I got I was bitten by the soil bug hardcore about six years ago, and you like, having your turf farm was kind of the peak, and then a bunch of other stuff happened, and it kind of just it went away, and and uh, when I'm always looking on Audible for uh, you know regenerative agricultural books, um, there's hardly yeah. anything out there, and yeah. the last time I searched, your book popped up. And I just, I bought it, I bought it immediately and uh, listened to it pretty much in, in one stretch. And I, mm -hmm. I got the bug again. <laughs> you've, uh, awesome. you've ignited the, the soil bug. So what, what I'm hoping to do today is kind of go through some of the, um, the uh, notes that I've, I've made as well, listen to your book and, uh, and hopefully do a deep dive into some of those, those topics. But before we do that, uh, why don't you kind of just fill folks in quickly about your your background and and why you wrote the book that you just wrote? Fabulous. Well, thanks for having me, Dakota, and it is really lovely to see you again. Um, if I can just refer to the word guru, you know, guru <laughs> for some people is like kind of uncomfortable. Actually, I really love it because if you spell guru, like spell guru, how do you spell it? Uh, G U R U, right? G U R U, and so for me, that <laughs> that's what a guru kind of entails is somebody yeah. that's really happy to walk their walk and be themselves and be authentic, and yeah. um, that's kind of something really dear to my heart is being myself through whatever the world throws at you and being, um, yeah, I don't know, just being real. I think we need more yeah. people that are willing to be real and be vulnerable and and be stupid and and do all you know. And it's like writing a book and you know this experience for yourself is it's that willingness to go okay here's a line in the sand and here are the words that i'm gonna yeah. share but those words might change next year and i'll be like oh man <laughs> but you've got to have the confidence to just put that line in the sand and um yeah so the book really came through um you know i work with growers and farmers and ranchers through north america and australia and new zealand and people were like can you just can we have a soils for dummies book? And I'm like, well, I'm probably not going to be the one to write that, but <laughs> I think try and put some of these real complex ideas in more simple language in terms of like, how do we unscience some of the, the, the wording? Because I think a lot of the time you read these huge words and I'm sure scientists just do it to feel special because no one can oh, say totally, it. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, all right, let's, let's put this into grounding in terms of what does that mean in the real world? And so using people's stories as a way to convey information is something I'm really passionate about. And, you know, I get to, I get to live with people. And, and until recently, I haven't had a house. I've been living in people's homes and for the last five years. And so just meeting extraordinary people and going, I really want to give these people a voice for what they're doing, um, what they're transforming, not only with soil and with animal health and plant health and nutrient density and and just show how simple these steps can be, really. So I was kind of hoping I could put it in a way that it kind of makes it sensible in terms of how my mind works when I'm when I'm on a piece of land, um, how to make the implicit explicit, I guess, because so much of it's internal and so much of it, uh, you know, you don't necessarily see a lot of this stuff written down. So yeah. that was that was the drive. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, and you just did a, a, a fantastic job. Like I've. Uh, I've taken soil health courses from Elaine Ingham and guys like Jay Fuhr. I've watched like, hundreds of hours of videos and you are by far like the, the top of the list in terms of, of like, like, uh, like being, being able to, to take, just like you said, those, those complex scientific ideas, but then put it into something that people can use, but that's, that's, that's practical and understandable. And you've got, you know, the, these little, um, uh, like you know the like the sayings they like just 
I, to be honest, I've, I've actually have a, um, I've done some soil health videos and stuff on, on our farm and it's like almost all your stuff. Like there's, there's a little <laughs> bit of Langham, Langham stuff in there. It's, it's fantastic. I've, I still use your, um, like your, uh, your analogy of, of how like soil health needs is the same thing that, that you need. It's like, you know, yeah. air, water, food, and shelter, basically. And so it's like, which one of those, like, yeah. in terms of triaging, which one of those is most important? It's like, what mm. that for me, I, I finally started to understand soil health. And yeah. Um, and that, that, that analogy actually came from Dr. Arden Anderson. And so oh, okay. sometimes I feel like I'm this magpie and I kind of go, <laughs> oh, it's shiny, it's pretty, I'm going to take that. Um, <laughs> But I think that is what a storyteller does. You yeah. know, we, we pick up um, maybe ideas that can be explained in a more scientific view, but they're not landing with farmers. And it's yeah. like, how do, we, how do we get this wording yeah. out to the wider community? Because yeah. I think there's been brilliant work by incredible scientists and researchers for, for absolute decades that is not out in the public realm at all, because mm -hmm. <laughs> who's going to troll? it yeah and yeah that's what I, I really enjoy trawling through that and then go oh how do we put that into English yeah well but also like the, the way that you told the story like it was through um uh, and I'm sure this was intentional but there was like like a little bit of science and then like a case study of a farmer that you were working with and you know some of their struggles and then like a success story. it was it was just like it was really easy to listen to and mm -hmm. uh, it was you know like funny and just I was a, a fantastic job mm -hmm. so <laughs> Um, well, thank okay, you. So but so, yeah, see, a lot of my background is actually in um, behavior change as well. So that's uh, actually okay. it's quite funny because a lot of the time I go, I don't, I don't really like people. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> quite happy just out yeah. in the wilderness by myself. But um, it's how everything to, that we're dealing with on the whole planet comes back to people and behavior change. And yeah, if you read through. All behavior change work it's like we don't change people because we give them data or we scare them into thinking you know the planet's falling apart or any of that what changes behavior is connecting with the heart it's yeah. that emotional heart based and that so so much of those stories are coming back to the heart of why do why do we make these efforts and why are we changing these systems and, mm -hmm. and it's what people love and care about and so yeah yeah for me was a yeah, the only way you can convey that is through stories. You don't show data on that stuff. No, no, and but but it, it also like your book also read. Um, and if, did you did you ever read uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not when you uh, when you grew up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I loved that. Yeah. There, there was like it was like part that, but then part just like this these heartfelt stories because like you, you threw in these like you know these scientific tidbits that were just like. I mean, so we're, we're in the middle of winter here now, or just getting started like you are. And mm -hmm. uh, I listen to audiobooks while I'm doing chores. And it was like every five minutes, I had to like press pause to write out, like to remember <laughs> some of these things that you had said. And I was freezing my fingers <laughs> as I was doing Oh, it. man. See, that's, that's why you need the paper book. And I'm going to get one too. <laughs> uh, so and I think that's the thing is for so long we've... Um, Farmers and ranchers have seen phenomenon like, you know, like the changing in weeds, you know, not, no longer seeing weed pressures or seeing animal health improve or seeing um, springs spring up on their land because they've restored their water cycles. And there hasn't really been any research to come in behind it until really, really recently. Yeah. And so it's kind of super fun to say, all right, well, maybe the scientific community is 20 years behind producers. And I think that's probably fairly accurate. Yeah. Um, and now like to look at quorum sensing and the, like the, the value of doing extracts or compost on seeds and, and how that sets that plant up for life. And it's mm -hmm. like, that, you know, traditional natural Korean farming or traditional farming practices have, have done those things. Um, and it's always been sort of poo pooed. And now suddenly it's like, oh, actually there's these, all of this phenomenon that's going on. Totally. It's so cool. Totally. Well, yeah. and it's, it's funny you mentioned that because the the, um, the quorum sensing is one of the things that I'd never heard of before I, before I read your book. But mm. as soon as you mentioned it, the first thing that came to my mind was Korean farming because I'd always thought I was like, ah, this this seems yeah. just like such a like like such a silver bullety thing, and I kind of threw it away. But it's, it, as you were talking, yeah. that's what that's what it is. Or I had, I had a hunch that that's what it was. 
but but before yeah. we, before we dive into that, the the I, I wanted to start with another one of your frameworks that um, I hadn't heard from you before, which was the the five M's of soil health. And uh, so could you could you go through those five M's for for folks? So we often think about what's enabling or what's limiting any environment or people be like, how do you fix compaction or why have I got spots on my lemons or, you know, whatever's bothering people. I say, well, we got to look to those five M's, which of those factors is, is, is causing a drag on the system. Cause sometimes people will say, oh, all I need is management or all I need to do is, is microbial extracts, or I just need to balance my calcium to magnesium ratio and everything will be great. And so the five M's looks at, is it your mindset that's putting a drag on the system? Is it your management? Is it your organic matter or is it your minerals or your microbes? And I know um, organic matter is kind of cheap. <laughs> it's like an M, you go, um. Um, And so we look to which of those is actually why you're not achieving the full potential. Um, you know, and often it can be a couple of those, but um, it's quite amazing to me how often it's mindset. Um, and then the next yeah. to look really is your management. Um, and how quick people are to kind of reach for these packaged products or the biostimulants or whatever. And it's like, you can do that and not have, I guess, the right mindset or the right management, but it's going to cost you a lot of money and it's going to take a lot of time as opposed to people that are willing to go, all right, I'm going to really take care of my management, going to hone that side of things. My mind's in the right place. All right. And, you know, then what, what do we start to look at? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I mean the 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 mindset or or you know the, the paradigm is is another you know holistic management talks a lot about that and it's it, it's it's such a um, you you literally cannot see things because of the assumptions that you're that you're having and uh, I know like I do a bit of consulting and stuff too and it's it is it's the the single biggest limiting factor um, to success with with. Uh, mm -hmm with clients. And, um, and so that was one of the nice things about your book is like, is just highlighting how, how producers who kind of, who have gone through those mindset shifts and, and how they were able to overcome that or people who, who just kind of seem to have been, um, you know, have that innate ability to, to maintain uh, positivity and how it's, mm -hmm. it, it, everything else is just details after that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it also points to why you never want to get in an argument with someone with a different paradigm is um, yeah. they can't hear you, you they can't. can't hear you. And I've often been asked to go and do like scientific debates on stages with like yeah. hardcore conventional agronomists. And I'm like, I have no interest in doing that because we're not speaking into the same world at all. And they can't see my world. Like I've taken, um, I, I have what I call my nemesis and everyone should have a nemesis. Um, <laughs> I, I, I took him to a, a dairy farm uh, to have a look at, here's this place that hasn't put any NPK on for 16 years, high performance dairy, amazing looking pastures. Mm -hmm. And um, he walked around all day and he rated their pasture 11 out of 10. He was so impressed. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, I said, how, you know, what do you think? Why is he so successful? And he said, because he's mining his fertilizer. And it's like 16 years. <laughs> He's mining his fertilizer. So he was unable to kind of go, oh, wow, with really good management, stimulating microbiology, we can have equivalent yields and have better outcomes. But yeah, so yeah, I think it's a really good point about them. Yeah. Paradigms. Well, and then the, the other uh, kind of the, the introduction to your book, one of the other things that you said was if, if we wait for science to provide the answers, we will come up short. And so I just, can you unpack that a little bit? Because like some people, like, Coming from it, coming from a scientist like yourself, mm. I'm sure that some people would be like, "Oh, that's weird. Don't we don't we need science to back up, you know, these these things that we're we're doing on our farms today?" We do, and I think you summed it up really well by saying "backed up," you know, because um, that and and if you talk to scientists on the side and very quietly, they will all say science is science science is not there to be the leader. Yeah, the leadership and the really happens on the ground and I've had multiple scientists tell me that mm -hmm. and I'm actually part of a research group um, in New Zealand and in Australia right now that's very exciting because it's being driven by a scientist that's like this entire system's broken just like the entire health and education systems are broken we need to be looking at things holistically we need to actually bring farmers into the table and have these conversations where we 
listen to what they're saying and we provide what it is that they're asking for instead of just like you be quiet we've got the answers that whole top down thing and and i think we're seeing global shifts in those paradigms across the world right now is that that top down mentality doesn't work yeah. and scientists have no idea what farmers are doing or no idea what farmers are managing or ranchers in terms of all of the observations that they make all of the intuitive things that make the difference between you having a, a, a business that thrives or a business that fails. And, um, and it's not to say that research doesn't have value, but they don't understand all of the dynamics of what producers have to, to manage. And so it's very easy to study things and, re, you know, and reduce it and be in this linear mm -hmm. model. And I think it's into helping us understand what's happening on farm, but they're not there to provide that real leadership. Um, yeah, but I think together we have some pretty awesome outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's my, um, uh, I don't, have you ever read Nassim Taleb? Um, he wrote books like Anti-Fragile and, and The Black Swan. Oh. He has this um, this idea that uh, kind of in, in the kind of um, academic world, everybody thinks that like academics drive innovation and then and then they kind of bring it out into industry or, and then it gets developed. I think actually it's the exact opposite. Yeah. Basically most of it's just trial and error and just happy little accidents. And then academics yeah. do research to understand why it works. And, and then you can yeah. be able to tweak yeah. a little bit after that. And, and that's, that's really what I, 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 again, I got that sense from your book. It was, there's this boots on the ground approach that, that you kind of explain, you know, how some of these soil processes work. And then you, you, back, and then you say, oh, here's why. And yeah, it's just super accessible. So the, the, the other thing, uh, while we're on this, this idea of mindset, um, one of the things that um, in the introduction that also really jumped out at me, which I'd never, um, I, I've, I've, I, I've, I kind of got halfway there myself, but when you, when you first said it, it was like the, the language of farming is one of dominance. And it was like this, it's a masculine, thing and, and it just like it, it hit me because like if, if you if you like George Orwell said if you control language you you control yes. thought and actions and so could you just yes. explain that how how language or far, farming is a is a is a language of dominance oh I so, I'm so glad you picked up on that and that just kind of gave me all these shivers like <laughs> um yeah and it it is and I mean I've had more and more insights in this in the last couple of years as well around how our language is constructed, which is it's constructed around um, nouns so that everything is named and everything is separate. Um, and they've done some really interesting studies looking at how um, Eastern cultures differ from that in terms of their language is all about verbs and connectedness. So they're looking in their language, how does this relate to this as a whole? Yeah. Whereas we're trained from the moment we're born to look at everything individually and that's a really really hard thing to break out of and part of that you could almost say relates to this idea of um, controlling thought and education from very early on to get people ready to receive commands because you either wanted them in the military or you wanted them working in uh, you know in great big factories or whatever and just you know shut up sit down and, and, and fulfill on this kind of thing and I think we've Thing. that's what's exciting about being on the planet at this period of time is we're starting to question the, the interconnectedness and <laughs> I said this recently and it kind of cracked me up but the cracked myself up um, about how the hippies were right about how everything is interconnected and yeah. and it's actually the, the the networks and those twines that are actually the most important part but we've been trained through our language to look at um, no this is individual and if I was in a I was in a science conference and there was a plant physiologist that was then followed by um, a root guy who was then followed by a, my, um, a mycologist and they were all talking about the same problem. None of them had the solution, but collectively all three of them did. But they weren't talking to each other, you know, because you have the plant physiology buildings over there and the soil science buildings over there and never the twain shall meet and so um everything's just seen in, in silos and and it's created more of a problem because we think we can control nature and it's an absolute fallacy and the sooner we wake up to that the better and start to realize okay what what would the patterns of nature be how do we work with nature because if we don't 
we've got you know losses to the environment or catastrophic climate change or whatever's going on insects attack and you guys might be seeing this up in your part of the world it's just the the grasshoppers in the last two years in North America have been insane mm. they're just almost proportions huh. and it's like those are the consequences and I talk a lot about the unintended consequences yeah. those are the unintended yeah. consequences of thinking that we can beat nature and trying to treat things in silos yeah yeah absolutely and and it's but it's it's one of those things like you, you don't see it until like, because you because it's 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 part of your paradigm or it's part of your mindset you, and, until somebody mentions it to you and hopefully you're in a state of mind where you can accept it and and um it uh it's a huge shift one of the uh, the the book that, that we just wrote that I, I had this whole section where i went through um the there's literally uh, for every letter of the alphabet there is a, a trademark agricultural herbicide for every single letter of the alphabet and they're all like uh warlike names so it's yeah. like, like alpha you know delta um uh you know gu guillotine scepter rifle shotgun like every oh, single one of them. And, and like there's like, it's totally this this language of dominance and control and and fear and like the, I think it was Chief um, Die. Chief Chief Dan George who said like that that which you do not understand you will fear and that which you fear you will destroy, and so we've literally created this self fulfilling prophecy of of wrecking nature and but it's it's baked right into our our culture and our language and yeah um, but unfortunately I think this whole philosophy of kill 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 is at the end of it we don't destroy nature we no. destroy ourselves yeah and that's what we're going to see is that planet's going to be fine we're not we're not trying to like yes. fight planet planet's going to keep going just <laughs> fine but I think this brings in a lot of the what makes it so joy filled about working in the regenerative space is we bring in the art and the creativity to how do we manage landscapes instead of waking up? What am I, what am I going to kill today? You know, and I've heard quite <laughs> my crop guys would say that, like, I used to wake up and that was what was on my mind. Who was yeah. I going to kill? Yeah. And how that affects your whole, it is your mindset. It's your well being. It's, mm -hmm. um, you know, drinking alcohol, it's avoiding the family. It's yes. all of those social yes. dynamics that are broken down because your, your life sucks really. If yes. you're out there just yeah. kill stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and um, I mean, I, I, here in Alberta, there's actually uh, in the last few years, there's, there's um, a special a suicide hotline just for farmers because, yeah, because it's, it's just so depressing. And, um, and, and I think, and I, I'm trying to think, I, I don't think you, you touched on this in the, I'm, I'm sure you did, but the, um, just the importance of, of, of not like these farmers, who are, who are using these things aren't bad people like they're, they're not they're not evil or out, like a lot of them are trapped and um uh, and so like you know in terms of like like you said before I, it, the, there's no point in having a debate with these people and, and pointing your finger and you shouldn't be spraying those things it's it's about compassion and understanding and um and leading by example and yeah uh, i think what what i what I did point to, and it's a, it's a subject dear to my heart, and it's actually what my master's thesis topic was that I didn't finish, but it was around what, what are the structures? Yeah, I'd, I'm so lazy, you know, working and writing a book. I just couldn't do master's as well. Is what were the structures that created this current situation in agriculture? And it, it's not, it, this is not landing on the feet of the farmers at all. This is around the responsibility of the research, the universities, the companies that really stepped in and went, oh, no, no, you, you don't need to understand these systems. You just need to apply this chemical and getting yeah. people into the yeah. calendar spraying. And what happens is people now have so much debt and so much stress that they've shown that like your cognitive ability drops. I'm trying to think what it is. It might be like 14 IQ points and um, that they're in high levels of flight or fight stress basically just like are you going to get a harvest are you going to make money what's happening with you know grasshoppers or whatever mm -hmm. and when you're in that flight or fight state like all of that all your blood flow actually goes to your extremities 
So instead of feeding your brain, it actually goes to your legs and arms so you can run away from the tiger. But there's no tiger. Yeah. That tiger is, yeah. you know, like dead. And so it actually um, subverts our ability to think clearly and make new decisions because we're so frightened of risk and so frightened of stepping out. And it's a, it's a, it's a really violent self-perpetuating cycle, unfortunately. Yeah. And I really, I really, really feel for these guys. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but 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 that that's where like like stories like like the I don't know how many case studies were in your book is at least a half a dozen. Like you're absolutely right. that's that's what's going to get these farmers to, to it's, it's hope. That's the like the biggest thing they need right now is is hope and that like you know you I think you had kind of uh, a bunch of different farmers whether they were you know you know like a thirty or forty thousand acre farm up in you know northern Alberta to like you know small scale producers. Um, and you know, livestock every, everywhere in between. It's like any farmer in the world can find themselves in one of these stories and realize, hey, somebody's been here yeah. before me. They got yeah. through it. I can too, and um, and they can make that change. Yeah. <clears throat> so the b- before we dive into the, um, I, I I I don't want to go through all of the. You did a fantastic job of of underlying the like the cliff that we're heading towards in terms of like, like it's yeah. a matter of, of, you know, uh, when, not if, you know, soil yeah. health runs out and, and everything kind of comes home to roost. Mm-hmm. But the, the, mm-hmm. the one thing that um, I, that, that punched me in the face <laughs> when I was, <laughs> was, uh, was you, you had this line nitrogen applied in the 1950s is only reaching rivers today. And that, yeah. like, the, the delayed, like, side effect of that, like, I was, mm-hmm. I, I had this kind of sense that, like, hey, like, we're, we're, we're just over the hill, like, you know, we're, 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 things couldn't possibly get any worse. It's like, well, actually, there might be, like, a 50-year <laughs> delay for how, for the shit that, like, you know, my grandparents did, uh, or our, our grandparents yeah. did. Um, Maybe, and, and to put context around that, it's, that's very much around... Um, that was New Zealand data. Mm-hmm. So it's gonna depend on how um, water water tables and aquifers work in different places. So in some places, you know, it's it's just rushing straight through. Um, but yeah, if you have these cast landscapes with the limestone, you know, it it, it moves like trickling through mm-hmm. and um, yeah, you do have some of those in Canada. <laughs> yeah. The thing with Canada is you don't, um, I mean, it depends where you are, but like, places I've worked in further north in Alberta, you know, they haven't been in that intensive agricultural program for that long, you know, to try and give you some hope. <laughs> no. no, well, and I, I still have a, a ton of hope, but that, that was just like the the kind of the delayed consequences or the like unintended consequences and how like there's, it can, like one of the, um, one of the things that uh, um, is like a core kind of principle within within permaculture is like is like people make bad decisions when they don't have quick enough feedback, and so it's like yeah. if if you do something and you get slapped in the face like immediately like you're you're not going to do that again. But it's so hard with these complex living systems or as, as you call them wicked problems, where you know yeah. one variable is changing the system, and you don't get the results or the negative consequences for a generation like like you know for example you and you were talking about the um your kind of personal health um journey with i can't remember what the name of the the chemical that um that paraquat was, paraquat yeah and and like how yeah. that that's it's transferred like onto like the next or can be transferred onto the next generation and things like that that's is right that's right and you know paraquat's a is a residual herbicide that ended up in my spinal fluid and took took 15 years for us to find out what it was so i'd been sick with a chemical poisoning without realizing what the poisoning was yeah. um but fungicides and pesticides actually change our epigenetic expression so you might be fine spraying a herbicide or a pesticide so your great grandparents might have been and this is what we're seeing is that we're changing that profile through the generations so now we're having children that are being born and have you know childhood leukemias or autism or all these different disorders. And it's like, that was a cumulative effect that came through your genetic code from your, your grandfather who was out there spraying whatever. Yeah. And we are so slow to respond to this. And actually there's more and more research unfortunately coming out about it. And the thing I hate about it the most is 
um, it puts people in the state of feeling totally powerless. Like, yeah. what do you do with that now? We've got so many children with learning disorders and all sorts of um, cognitive issues. And it wasn't, and I mean, the horrible thing sometimes is parents going, that was my fault. I, I, I knew to eat this or I knew not to do this practice and yet I was doing that and now they're going to have to deal with that for the rest of their life and and that is incredibly sobering and, and something for me that that does make me feel quite passionate about this space in terms of we need to wake up and we need to wake up fast yeah yeah but the, and this is where maybe kind of quorum sensing can come in and and because the, the I'll have to get you to explain this to me again, because I'd never heard that word before reading your book, but um, the, um, yeah, just I'll, I'll butcher it. So you, go ahead, <laughs> uh, explain it again. Uh, um, so the, the process of quorum sensing was originally discovered in the 1950s, looking at bioluminescence. So I don't know if you've ever been to the beach and you at night and you splash yeah. the waves and they all light up. So they're trying to figure out is what made those um, phytoplankton respond to each other? How do they know to all light up at the same time? And what they are is these different types of chemical um, signals that say turn on or turn off. And so at any one point you could have strep organisms in your throat, but you're not virulent, you don't have a sore throat. And then suddenly now we have virulence because those organisms reach a certain point of their population dynamic to form a quorum, basically to form an agreement. They're oh. sending out a call that says, right, everyone's in agreement, let's go for it. And now you're sick. So they've developed um, some of these quorum signals, for instance, there's one to control cholera. So it's you only need like parts per trillion, parts per billion. You can drink a drink that might have like one little drop of this chemical signature in it. Yeah. And it tells the cholera to basically leave the host there's too many other cholera here we should just leave so we're not going to have the issues of antibiotic resistance or chemical resistance or whatever it is because we, we're actually communicating with biology in the way that it receives it and what's really interesting is that signal for cholera is the same signal to turn off many fungal diseases in plants so um we're seeing this big blow up in the research because it's like, cool, how could we use this in agriculture? You know, if we're dealing with parts per trillion, parts per billion, wow. switching biology on or with quorum quenching, turning them off, it's just opened up this whole world of possibility. Wow. And so the, the can you um now can you connect connect the dots between that and like Korean natural farming and how like again, here's this, here's this like this pr practical thing that's been, you know, people have been doing it for you know, I don't know, it was at least 50 or 60 years and. Yep. Oh, thousands of years. Korean exactly. natural farming, those practices with lactobacillus and um, some of the effective microorganisms. This is old traditional knowledge. You know, some of the um, like making phosphate and rock, bone, those kind of preparations. We're talking about very, very old traditional stuff. Uh, okay. Um, so consider that every single cell, every cell, that includes bacteria, but cells in your body have a hundred thousand receptors on a single cell. And those receptors are waiting for some kind of signal, which enables them to either turn on gene expression or um, regulate some kind of, it might be something in the body or something in the soil or the soil microbiology responding to heat or nutrient loading or water or whatever. So they, they've got these little receptors and they're basically waiting for these different signals. And they need this because you think underneath the soil, you haven't got eyes and ears and mouths and all that kind of stuff that, that the only way they can sense their environment is through these signals. And so these microbes, will, they, they might even pretend to be each other to hide so they can sneak up on their prey and then eat them. Um, they might use it as a form of communication. So they had this um, video of protozoa hunting down a nematode using these signals, basically like a pack of wolves. Wow. So these signaling molecules are like the soil is just laden with them. And then that's what we're adding when we do, um, let's say, lactobacillus. It's not only the living organism you're putting in, it's also their metabolites. And so for me, I'm not a big fan of compost teas. You know, I'm more likely to use a slurry or use um, extracts from, you know, compost or vermicast or wood chips or whatever. And what we're putting out are the metabolites. And that's why we're getting the results that we're getting in some of this rangeland is we're only putting on like, 
maybe two kilos a hectare of some kind of compost and getting a plant germination responses. So plants will germinate in response to these signals. Microbiology are all responding and you're basically just switching that system back on. And that, that's what sort of opened up a whole doorway for us when we're dealing with large scale rangeland. Wow. So the, the I don't know why I, I didn't this I didn't connect this dot till now, but is there like, is there any connection to like like homeopathic medicine? Like is that almost like a similar thing to, to quorum sensing or is that a, is that a different um would that be a different process? It's a different process because homeopathic's even more dilute than one part yeah. per billion. They're incredibly, incredibly dilute. But I think that potentially that might be fulfilling part of this. And it also explains a lot of Chinese herbal medicine um, because again, we're dealing in these very, very, very small amounts of these signaling molecules. And it, it is what a plant is doing in the, in the soil system as well. So the plant is signaling to microbiology all the time, microbiology responding back. And so I often think of a plant as like all its sort of systems are outside of its body. So it's digestive system, it's immune system, it's um, immunity all happens outside of its body. And it does that by stimulating microbiology, building these rhizosheaths and building protection. But if that plant doesn't have those microbial partners, it actually can't digest its food very well. It actually doesn't have immunity. So it might be sending a signal saying, well, I'm under attack, help. And unless it's, its partner organisms are there to respond, it can't defend itself. And that's really how we could describe modern agriculture is, it's just naked plants basically going, help, help. And really <laughs> some microbes there, they're not the beneficials often. Yeah. Totally. And so just to, the, um, just for, to be clear to folk, folks, like this, uh, it's, it's quorum sensing spelled the same way as like you'd, you'd achieve like a quorum in a, in a town hall meeting, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So that, right. I, I didn't. I didn't pick up on that. The the New Zealand. Oh, because you're you're listening, not reading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, what right. is this? You'll get fluent. <laughs> you're going and googling. Yeah. H. No, it's you. You. That's that's um that's brilliant. Uh, so that there was there was a couple um examples. I hear what they were what they're in the book about how and you mentioned one of them was like compost teas and and basically getting you know plants to um uh you know like turn on again but like there's there were some mm. other examples you gave in the book um and one of them was for, for like human health but i can't remember what it was do you remember the um, fulvic, fulvic acid yeah okay fulvic. Yeah. yeah yeah i'm a big yeah. fan of fulvic acid for the same reason so that's f-u-l-v-i-c fulvic not folic acid get people running off to <laughs> you know pregnant mothers no um yeah, so fulvic acid does something very similar as to what humates do for livestock. So I talked about, I think I talked about in the book, like it, um, it relaxes the villi of the gut, it, re it repairs the tight junctions um, it, in your intestinal lining, um, it binds to any kind of toxins. Um, so, we, you know, I don't know what it is in Canada, but here in America, 90% of waterways are contaminated with glyphosate and that includes the rain. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's really challenging. We are being bombarded by, you know, this chemical soup. And so for me, fulvic acid, which I, I just tell people to take it. I forget to take it mostly. It's in my cupboard. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember to take it if I'm ever feeling a little bit flat, but um, is a great one for really, um, you know, helping the efficiency. Even if you take it when you're taking your vitamins, it'll help with your vitamin uptake and efficiencies. Um, and it's 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 really cheap. Yeah, it's something you can just put in with your diet, put in with a bit of water, whatever. But yeah, that's 65 million year old quorum signals from bacteria and fungi breaking down organic material is now these soft brown coals that we extract to use for fulvic and humic acids. Wow. Cool. wow. Um, so the, um, the, the other thing that I wanted to uh, uh, talk about, which is, I, mean, I don't know if this is exactly um, quorum sensing again, but another thing that jumped out at me was um, you were talking about the, uh, the uh, I can't remember how to pronounce it, petrochor or petrochor, the, the, the smell of uh, right rain after rain. And there, there's, there's a bacteria yeah. that is a bacteria that produces that that smell is that correct 
or is it? Or is um, it so geosmin, geosmin is is the one that's the odor of the organisms. Petrichor is kind of all the smells. So your volatile organic compounds, the smells of that come off rocks, mm -hmm. um, decomposing organic material. But geosmin is literally translates as the odor of the earth, and that comes from what what is called actino. My seats, but I know that Elaine Ingham's a big one about calling it actinobacteria because they are a bacteria, but they haven't been really, re you know, there's still organisms that are called actinomycetes in the literature. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those organisms, what you can smell is really um, effectively the natural antibiotics because those actinomycetes are what we make streptomycin from, for instance. So there's about 400 different types of commercial antibiotics and they come from the soil and this is the this is the other exciting thing is there's so much to discover in terms of human health from the soil because um and really if you think about it we evolved alongside soil animals have evolved after the microbiology in soil so so much of what makes up our bodies actually originally came from soil and i think so much of our human health issues we can we can discover these solutions in the soil. I know they're they're creating this um, PTSD vaccine that's actually coming from the fatty membranes of a type of bacteria in the soil, which is kind of cool. So yeah. the first response in, in people in in fighting in Afghanistan or whatever, they can have a vaccine against PTSD. Wow! From the soil. yeah yeah, and and that was that was the other thing that that really stood out to me again was this this idea of kind of like the, the fractal nature of of everything like like how in the same way that you know soil health needs food water air and shelter just like humans need food water share and alter like the, the 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 there's you know there's the bacteria in the soil that can help calm us down or uh, one of the uh, the stats you gave was how the, the humans the, the human um uh ability to smell that 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 petrichor is is 200,000 yeah. times more sensitive than a great white shark's ability to smell blood in the water. And Isn't it's, it mad? It's, and it's like, 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 like uh, I believe that like everything happens like, like through like evolution and biology, everything happens for a reason. Like there, there are no such thing as like vestigial organs. Like they're, it, yeah. it, and so like, what, why, why was it so important for us to be able to smell like that, the kind of like a, the healthy ecosystem? Why, why did, why do we have those receptors if, if there wasn't some reason for that? Reason. It's to remind us of where we came from. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It's your mother. Yeah. Respect it. Be, feel, feel lit up and, and excited about that smell. Like it's a smell that just makes, I don't know, I, for most people, makes people feel really, really good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the science is still out. They're still trying to figure out, you know, uh, they're going, well, maybe it's to tell you that your food's been contaminated or something. And it's like, nah, it's, yeah. it's not cutting it. There's, um, yeah. there's, there's something deeper that we, we don't have the technology yet to understand. Yeah. So the, uh, now I, I kind of want to pivot and, and get into a little bit of the, um, like the, the how-to of soil health. And, and this is purely selfishly for my, <laughs> for, <laughs> for our farm. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of other people that like me who've, they've, I've done a lot of like experiments and most of them have failed. I kind of, I dabbled in a lot of things. And you talk about this in the book, people who just, they don't, they don't commit to one thing long enough to see the benefits. And then they go, ah, it doesn't work. And they, <laughs> they go to something else. Yeah. And yeah, um, that mindset thing. Yeah, and and so for for um, for me, one of the um, the uh, I'm I'm kind of like stuck between two camps right now. And there's like I, I love Gabe Brown and 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 all his work, and and he's his kind of claim to fame is like he's never used any, uh, or so he says he's never used any uh, compost teas or extracts or anything like that. The only thing he's ever right. used was uh, cover crop seeds uh, to, yes. to kind of prime his his soil health. And then there's, there's and, and, and 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 three years of composting his entire farm. He did ah see I he uh, I must have missed that part, but he, well no, but for the first three years he had total crop failure. So those crops stayed in the ground. They were damaged by hail. So three oh. years of crop. <laughs> so he had three years of growing a crop that wasn't removed that was then broken down That's, in the soil. Now. Um, 
he says now he can still do the same thing faster on other people's properties just using seed um and i, I don't i don't doubt him but i think um when i look at some of oh, just some brilliant examples out of australia and new zealand they often came out of similar stories of a couple of years of failed failed crops to buy you you might have grazed it off if, and maybe you didn't, but you had a whole lot of organic material that stayed around because it wasn't harvested due to different yeah. types of damage. Um, so I, I think I, context is everything, right? And this is why it's so important to go and see um, what is it that different people are dealing, dealing with? What is that situation? What was that base mm. um, material that they started from? Where did, you know, where did they start from? What is their climate? What, what are their soil types? What are they kind of really managing? Um, how degraded was it? Um, and, and what I find is there's not really one size fits all. And I think um, there can be a danger in thinking that just this one thing is, is gonna help save your bacon. Um, and I really love cover crops. I think um, having diverse species in the mix, but then looking to how do we get a perennial system that's working getting you know different types of root species um, species with different types of root architecture um, is extraordinary and I see so many people really turn soil around really fast with cover crops where they have infiltration problems um, yeah. just poor organic matter poor microbial activity and then I have equally seen huge amounts of total cover crop failures that have cost people an arm and a leg we're talking about a huge you know investment mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you've always got to step back and look at what is what are your specific goals for, you know, if it was something like cover crops and what type of species is going to fit those goals? What is your growth period? Have you got adequate moisture? Mm -hmm. um, and are there other tools that maybe can help address whatever it is that you might be addressing? But yeah, I really do love cover crops. And I think what Gabe Brown has done is absolutely extraordinary. Totally. However, to, to, to kind of um, come back to your kind of addressing like the triage of soil health and like coming back to those five M's, um, mm. the like for, for uh, I, I, we, we, did, we did a little bit of composting kind of early on and uh, I, I got, um, I, I was studying under Lane Ingham for, for a year kind of through her, her online program and she was big into like the compost teas, like the brews mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, you need like a $3,000 compost extractor and, and like I I cannot stand like <laughs> the that kind of stuff and so I got kind of totally pushed away from it and then that was around the time I found uh, Gabe Brown stuff and he was doing great work mm -hmm. with cover crops and so we went kind of whole hog in that we bought a no-till drill we bought like a whole seed library and um, and after doing I was like I don't know four or five years with the trials with that um, I, I can confidently say that the cover crop seeds were not addressing our weak link, at least on, on our kind of broad acre stuff. And yeah. however, in our, in my gardens where I I've been able to, it's a small area and you can, you can build soil health really quickly because you're able to add, you know, a foot of compost at a time there, I can plant the same crop cover crop mix on the same day. And the growth is just like, it's night and day. Mm -hmm. But out of my kind of pastures, a bit of context for our, our background, like uh, we sold hay for about 25 years. So we were mining our yeah. soil of, you know, 10 to 15,000 pounds of organic matter, plus all the minerals every year without mm -hmm. returning anything back because we've been organic for yeah. 30 years. And, um, and so it's, it's like, no matter how many seeds we put into the ground, like just nothing would, would grow. And, and so for us, it, it was, it was missing like the organic matter and, um, and a lot of the, uh, you know, nitrogen and, and things like that. But cause, and once I've addressed those things, it's just, everything just, just comes alive. But so I, yeah. it's really important yeah. to understand that, that context and to, to go through that triage of what's your limiting factor, because there's no point mm -hmm. in putting resources into something that isn't the limiting factor. No, that's right. And, and we do see, um, We've seen this in Australia as people really struggling with um, putting in cover crops to a very, very highly bacterial, very, very primitive soil and just not having any success whatsoever. And then seeing people that have really been addressing um, that major microbial imbalance and putting stuff down with the seed and actually seeing perennial establishment, even though these guys are in really low rainfall and just going, oh, actually that microbial 
peace had such a big say in whether or not those crops could even germinate or hold on with that bit of moisture. So, you know, having yeah. seed dressings, you know, this stuff doesn't have to cost a lot of money. You know, you've probably learned so much about seeds that you could use and how to drill it and getting all of that stuff right that it's just the tinkering now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and so that, that was, um, uh, kind of coming back to the, like the, what, what folks can do, um, mm. you, you mentioned a lot of these, uh, I remember the course we took, I, did you, did you refer to it as like your witch's brew? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. The things that you remember these, these lists of, they're like 10, 15. Yeah. Things. yeah. I've, I don't know where you buy any one of these things, let alone. Oh, uh, they're all available in Canada. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. I guess yeah. is there a place that folks can go to um, like, do you, do you recommend any distributors or, or companies that sell that stuff or is it just Google? No, Cause we're not, we're not aligned with any product. And also the challenge of working internationally is just not knowing. Yeah. They'd be able to vouch for products. Yeah. Um, have, you guys do have some pretty good distributors. And if you're on a smaller scale, um, interestingly enough, often the marijuana guys, is it legal in Canada? It, it is, yeah, yeah. The hydroponic stores um, often have like incredible microbial, like it's quite funny when I first started um, into vermiculture and composting like uh, 20, 21 years ago, um, the ones who were coming to the door and the ones that I was selling the most vermicast to were the marijuana guys and it's illegal in New Zealand. Actually, they've just had a um, referendum. Oh, that's right, to still be illegal. <laughs> um, uh, uh, they, they know a lot about the microbials in terms of seed treatments because they have to be able to set a plant up to be able to walk away and not come back to it until harvest yeah. so you need to know it to survive any nutrient issues yeah. any water deficiencies and so they know how to make a, a crop survive in the wild mm -hmm. um, and so yeah they, they, they taught me quite a lot about um, the, the different types of conditions for plants yeah yeah, that's, that's a good tip. I never, I never thought of uh, checking out the hydroponic stores as, um, yeah. as a source for that. I'll, uh, I'll have to try that out and do some, <clears throat> do some small scale trials. I, I know there are guys that you can buy like uh, pelletized um, huma like humates and, and things like that. Yep. And it's becoming a lot more um, common for sure. But it's, yeah, like, that's I, right. I just like, there's just so many products out there. And like you said in your book, like, the, a lot of these things they're not actually tested for for efficacy and so like it's no. it's it's really daunting for for farmers to like well like you have to now you have to know how to run a microscope and be able to test all this stuff and yeah and that that's just not always realistic I mean some of my best farmers I must say they they do know how to run microscopes um you know I, I actually just got an email recently from one of my cropping ex-cropping clients in Western Australia because I'm not consulting anymore and he's like I just wanted to check in because it's been like four years I think since I've seen him and he's like we've totally closed the loops um he'd done microscope training they they were making their own vermicast and compost and seed treatments and um you know brewing different things and he said like the, the place is just going from strength to strength and so that's kind of neat when you see people that are willing to kind of yeah. really educate them to be able to because it's either you're outsourcing that and you're paying with paying for it with money, or you internalize it and you, you pay for it in your own time. Um, but it is a lot of fun, you know. And you will know this from doing Elaine's courses of of looking at your own compost and teas and making things good. Or, but I mean, I, I was at a workshop recently. Well, not recently because I haven't been to any workshops recently. <laughs> um, and. Um, the, there was a rancher there who's showing all these slides of his compost tea and he was so proud of it and every single one of them was an anaerobic pathogen and I'm so sorry. <laughs> should I say something oh no I just like I quietly took it aside afterwards and I'm like so when it looks like that it's because like all the bacteria have got eaten everything like you could see the, the skeletons of fungi like I'm like yeah that that's it oh jeez. anyway but yeah, it's a, it's hard to teach a course when it's things like, you know, what, what does your nose tell you? What does your intuition tell you? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. But, the, but yeah. That, that's, that's what I like about your, your process is it's, it's very, um, it's very intuitive. And uh, I mean, like you're basically saying is like, like, what would you want if you were, if you were soil? It's like put yourself in the shoes of the soil and it's like, oh, it's, yeah, it's course. That's what, that's, what's causing it. 
And but I, I've never I've never seen any other soil health um, kind of educator talk about so like it's still this kind of like soil health is over there and we're over yeah here it's not like we're the same thing you know? we're so. in it. no <clears throat> no and yeah I, I i think it's helpful and i think some of the stuff around animal health and that tying in and just all the interrelationships i had this i don't know insight recently i was living with some cows on older spring ranch in idaho which was just an extraordinary experience of just range riding and being with the cows 24 7 mm -hmm. and just having this vision of like animals move across the landscape so too were their microbiology so there was like this cloud of microbes that were feeding on the methane or helping draw down carbon or you know building enzymes and vitamins and, and supporting the health of the animals and the plants and like this ecosystem imagine when the bison were running through these landscapes so just mm -hmm. that massaging of the land with their hooves and their saliva and their poop and their wheeze and all of it to like they're feeding the microbes and the microbes are feeding them and it's just this beautiful system yeah well and it's coming back to that that idea of of like what things used to be like in terms of like like we're i'm always amazed at how how quick things bounce back given how destroyed they are and how like we're really playing with like a fraction of the cards in the deck that, that used to be there and yet you can, yeah. you can still um have these these like night and day changes like like you're talking about the like the quorum sensing is it just as soon as you know that one hormones there the one you know mineral the, the boron or the magnesium mm -hmm. that, that was causing one thing yeah. and everything just suddenly just opens up and it, and yeah. it takes off and um yeah yeah, it's it's yeah, it's really exciting yeah. to and think why, how, where we can. That's go. why it is. That's why I think it's so important to figure out what your triage is, like where your place to start is, because so many people do coming into the regenerative space. Um, either they're working on their management, which is probably the number one place they should start, mm -hmm. or they get into the cross teas or extracts or stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and that might be something really you need to be looking at further down the track, like really thinking. Well, why is the system functioning like it is? Um, you know, you think of your example of exporting hay for 15 years and being organic for 30 years, like, and there's probably tillage in that, I imagine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah and so, um, so amazing how quickly these landscapes can rebound, but we still don't know what the full potential of these are because, um, you know, typically in Canada, well, it depends where you are, but like I was looking at some stuff in Manitoba and it's like 30 centimeters of topsoil, 30 to 50 centimeters of topsoil have been lost since agriculture began out there. So yeah. all of that top organic matter, when you cultivate the first stuff to blow away, the finest stuff is all your humus and your organic matter. So that's really what gives us resilience and the ability to bounce back. And so I think we see life come back, but it's still not, wow, what was the full expression of this landscape? No, and, and so like one of the uh, the things that always uh, amazes me is if you look back at those old, you know, the early black and white photographs of like some of the settlers, and you know yeah. these are folks that they came to the prairies with like you know like a a, a mule or a you know dairy cow and like a a moldboard plow that was made out of an old oak tree, and they literally just yeah. plowed up a pasture, threw some seeds in the ground, and then like three months later, there's a photo of them standing in a wheat crop that's above their head. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's a, it's a yeah. bumper crop. And it's like, how did they do that? And it's like, it, it wasn't because they didn't have the right tools or that, you know, GP, it, it was, they had soil health. And yeah, it's like, how, how simple could, could agriculture be if we had that level of, of soil health, like you're, you're talking about. Yeah. But without using a moldboard plow, I mean, it, it's <laughs> like, I'll be on ranches and there'll be homesteads, like all broken down, fallen apart. 100, over 100 year old homesteads and you're like where's their water and there will be no water like within 50 miles but there used to be and it's so interesting you look at satellite imagery and go there used to be water moving through these landscapes and it's yeah. all gone and all gone. I was talking to um, a cropping friend's mother who was saying on her way to school she used to ride like in a buggy and this is in Australia, and they could never go through these fields because there was always so much water. And now you go there and it's like a freaking desert and you're yeah. like, there was so much water, really? <clears throat> um, 
remember it like because the destruction in Australia and in New Zealand has happened so fast that it's still in people's lifetimes yeah. whereas here you can kind of think that the destruction happened even before the colonials or the cavalry arrived because disease was brought to the indigenous yeah. people when the first I guess um whether the fur the fur trappers mm -hmm. so the the indigenous people in terms of what they were doing with managing bison or with fire that was already disrupted by the time we got any early accounts you know to so like to read lewis and clark and go oh well there's a, a point in time where it was natural it's like no you still weren't looking at a natural ecosystem we have no idea we really don't yeah well and, and that's then, oh go, sorry go ahead no it's fine the but and that's where like particularly in in, in our climate like the uh, I always I've said before is like Aust the Aussies and the kind of like Kiwis are really lucky because like their their environment was so brittle that like they got quicker feedback because like you look at um, like you know permaculture and like holistic management and like th those 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 early kind of regenerative systems they came from brittle environments like Africa and and. Because they got Australia, the New Zealand's not New Zealand's not brittle. We're on the other end of the. Spectrum. Oh, okay. I've never I've never been there before. Um, it's but, very like, green. It's like Ireland a little bit. <laughs> or, so, but like like um, like uh, Pia Yeoman's you know key, key line design and stuff yes. like that. That like yes. versus here we have this kind of shifting baseline syndrome because like things degrade so slowly in like in Canada. Like, mm -hmm. you, you're talking about you know, farmers where, you know, there used to be springs. I have a photograph uh, from 1914 with my great, great grandparents. And they're literally standing in front of a hill um, with, um, it's like, with like a mud hut that they lived in with like three kids. And up on the, up on the hill was, was a, a hand dug well that they were getting water from, you know, maybe a, a 10 feet below the surface. And like now our water wells are 180 feet deep our lake used to be spring fed all the springs have dried up actually the this this year um i'm pretty sure a spring started up in the lake in, in our lake again because there's uh, the ice is, wow. is open spot and, it's, and i'm it's it's right beneath our all the swales and stuff on our farm where we've been infiltrating water mm -hmm. and it's yeah. like, like five five years we brought we've it seems like we brought up I, I i'm not sure about the lake but our, our dugout this year for the first time was spring fed it, it, didn't, yeah. it didn't drop over the year so yeah, we, we so can exciting. bring it back. Yeah, mm. we can bring it back. And I think we can bring it back fairly dramatically and, and relatively quickly, really, when you see some of these cases of people really bringing back ecosystem function. And, yeah. you know, we often yeah. see these cases, like you're right, in these brittle environments. And, and New Zealanders actually use that as an excuse to not try something because they're like, oh, it only works in brittle environments. And it's like, <laughs> dude, if it works out there, yeah. it's going to be easier for you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think people um, really need to wake up to how agriculture is affecting water cycles, and you know what we're seeing are these flash flooding events in cities now, and mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and and droughts that are affecting everything, and the aquifers drying up, and you know all of that story. And it's not just what we're we pulling out; it's just that you know these water systems are not. Not yeah. functioning yeah well i'd say like if you look back at historical rainfalls it's we're getting the same amount of rain pretty much you know as if yeah but it's it's just it's not going in it's it's um, yeah. it's it's this boom bust cycle yeah absolutely yeah. um so the um just one other uh or a couple other things that I, I wanted to uh just get a bit more uh, context from you mentioned several times in your book this this concept of like in 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 really like like top kind of soil health conditions, frost eating bacteria can actually mm -hmm. develop and in, in, in stop frost. And like you kind of mentioned yeah. it in passing and, and like, and yeah. I've never heard of this before. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> enlighten me. Cause yeah, in, yeah. In our ecosystem, uh, we have a hundred, was... hundred day growing season. So I could, I could use some of yeah. these guys. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the organism that I'm going to talk about can protect you down to a minus six degree frost. Um, so the organism is called Pseudomonas syringae. Um, now, if you think, like if, if you were to measure, you know, are there microbes in, in rainfall, for instance? So between 60 to 100% of all the raindrops contain micro, contain bacteria and fungi and all sorts of microbes. It's pretty cool. Um, but one of these organisms is called Pseudomonas 
I'm not going to forget it. Pseudomonas. Oh, I have forgotten it. I've got too busy thinking about it. All right, so it, it's a type of pseudomonas and it actually forms ice nucleation. So it's part of what enables rain to fall, but it's also an organism that makes the frost damage on the leaf surface. And so um, the pseudomonas, oh yeah, so there's two. So there's pseudomonas syringae is the yeah. one that makes the rain crystals in the frost and pseudomonas florensins that eats them. So pseudomonas florensins, that's where I got tripped up. I was in the wrong place. Pseudomonas florin, florensins is, ex, it, it comes out the back end of a worm. So the highest concentrations that you'll find this organism is actually in vermicast, so worm castings. So making an extract of good quality vermicast and using that as a protectant. And you can also buy um, these products. I don't know if they're commercially available actually in Canada, but um, yeah, and what's, what's really interesting about that. So that, that one application can last for two months, but you also need to think what else causes frost, like having low sugars and high water. So if your bricks or your plant photosynthesis is lower, then we're gonna have more water in the system. So that's gonna freeze. But just microbiology just make heat because they are respiring and reproducing. And you know, when you reproduce right, it makes quite a lot of heat. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> Apparently, that's right. Um, especially in Canada, right? Because you've got to do that in Canada to stay warm. Yeah. Um, is those soils, if they're well aerated and you've got all that gas diffusion and gas movement, those soils are significantly warmer. You've got microbiology, then making the system warmer. Then you have a microbe that's eating the frost causing one, and then you've got less water to freeze. So we get this multiple effect of just lifting soil health and getting that microbiology active. Um, and we've seen some pretty extraordinary stuff in vineyards and high cash crops. Mm -hmm. um, by doing this, which is kind of fun. But yeah, it's a, it's a good, do some trials for yourself, have a look. Yeah, that is, that is so great. And, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the other thing with the, with the bricks and how, um, cause like if anybody's ever tried to freeze berries before, um, mm. like, like the, the higher kind of the sugar content in, in the berry you're trying to freeze it, the longer it takes to freeze in the deep freeze. And, and mm -hmm. when you mentioned like plants with a high, high bricks or I was like, oh, of course it's, it's antifreeze. Oh. Like that's why an, antifreeze yeah. is, it tastes, it tastes sweet. <laughs> and uh, I hope like, you're not drinking antifreeze. No, no. <laughs> uh, well, this, this is, this is, uh, uh, I guess what farmers say, this is how um, it was, it was part of uh, some locals uh, cat um, uh, population management <laughs> strategy. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. So the um and, and that's what's so exciting about this is like like you there's all these like emergent properties like you know the the soil actually giving off heat that can you know extend your growing season mm -hmm. and um mm. that like we 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 have we have no idea what we're missing and yeah. what else can can kind of emerge to um to help us out <clears throat> mm. um so there's uh, a couple other things that um, that really struck me in your book was um, well I, I, I well, well maybe we'll finish with this so is the idea of of kind of using um, like quorum sensing or or uh, like the, the germination conditions for for certain plants like you know aka weeds and how if you if you shift the kind of the certain things in the ecosystem, those plants will mm -hmm. no longer germinate anymore. And mm -hmm. yeah, you just gave a, a fantastic kind of explanation of um, uh, particularly uh, like milk thistle around the fault mm -hmm. lines uh, yeah. that were giving off radon gas. And mm -hmm. yeah, so, so you that was it. That was it. That was an aha moment, you know, we try and track all your different aha moments. Yes. Um, but yeah, I really encourage people to, to start to see these weeds as indicators. You know, what is it that they're trying to tell you? So there's six main and interrelated reasons for why we might have what we call weeds or indicator plants. So one might be you have bare soil. One, you might have low organic matter. Might be your soils are compacted. You might have low mineral availability. There might be a microbial imbalance or it could be this safety valve. And so I think of that safety valve um, as either things like nitrates, 
um, or some kind of buildup, uh, heavy metals, some kind of toxins, we will see weeds that specifically respond to that. So for me, that one with the milk thistle was, uh, it was a pattern I'd started to see in really toxic environments. And the first time I saw the milk thistle growing, it was um, in a gully that the farmer told me had been an old landfill and it was full of batteries. Yeah. So the batteries were leaking and then that responded. And then I saw it on the San Andreas fault line, just thick along the fault line. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, that's kind of serious. And then after the 2010 earthquake in New Zealand, we saw milk thistle popping up all over the place. And you know, that synchronicity of life, I was sitting on a plane next to a woman who was a, a nuclear physicist, you know, as you do, you know, gotta, that's where you got to talk to people on the plane when, when you can be on plane again, talking yeah. to other people. And she, she was explaining to me that deep down through the earth's crust, when you get um, earthquake movement, there's actually uranium down there. And as they grind, they release this radon gas and the gas comes up and we have these plants mm. that are to mop it up and then I'm like oh yeah well milk thistle is what we use for our own livers as a detox so again yeah. that human health connection but yeah when we did the test sure enough there was radon um in these soils where this milk thistle was and um the plants the plants are trying to correct it so it's like just just leave them to do it mm -hmm. it's not really going to harm anybody else mm -hmm. but I think starting to really think what what have I what what's the scene that I've set that's enabled this plant to germinate because they're not there just because they feel like it like there is hundreds of thousands of seeds just in a just in a square meter of soil yeah. who is it that germinates is de dependent on those six factors yeah and that's just yeah. like a kind of total game changer is so that a little yeah. Uh, on, on our farm, my uh, so I farm with my parents, and for the past, uh, well, my whole life, we've been battling with a, a particular weed called uh, wormwood, or um, oh uh, yeah, ab yeah. absinthe wormwood. And <laughs> this is why I'm the only I'm the only one of six kids who uh, who came back to the farm is because most of our childhood was basically pulling this weed out of our oh. pasture. Oh, no. but, uh, my my no. parents my parents used to like. Uh, get me to go with a, with a tiger torch to like burn um, things like uh, toad oh. flax and stuff like because because we're organic so we can't use herbicides but but weeds are still bad and and um, mm -hmm. so like like to this day my parents still spend like two to three hours a day every day pulling weeds out of out of a field and uh, this is like that this mind oh. this mindset thing because I, I refuse to do it anymore because it's like I I've I've heard the science and I know the uh, how like they're an indicator of like something's going wrong mm -hmm. and it's like what if we would just yeah. use that same amount of time to address the root cause of these these symptoms but it's it's so funny how yeah. uh like it, it, maybe you'll you can relate to this too is is how like sometimes the most um people who are like really into like alternative health and like homeopathic medicine and you know like chinese medicine and things like that they'll, they don't apply the same, like, well, if, if you get sick, well, it's, you know, there's, it's an indicator that something's wrong in your environment and, and they treat it whole, very holistically, but then those same people have their garden sheds full of Roundup or, you know, dandelion yeah. <laughs> weeders. And it's like, well, hold on a second. Like your ecosystem's doing the same thing. Like how, yeah, what's, there's a total double so, standard. Here. Interesting. So have you done the leaf tissue testing on the wormwood? Uh, I, I, I don't think I did it with that one. I, I've done it with thistles before and, and the thistles, thistles, were, yeah. thistles were higher, but no, I, I haven't, yeah. um, I haven't done it with the, um, with the wormwood there, but, um, I, yeah. one of the patterns that I've noticed for, for it is like, it, it, it grows in just like the absolute worst soils, it can, like gravel pits is where it grows. Yeah. And so low, low organic matter. Yeah. Lo, yeah. Low organic matter, lo, low nutrients and, um, um, so it's <clears throat> to each to each their own. But the, I am excited. I'm gonna I'm gonna try um, using uh, the, one of the stories you told in the, in the book was about how um, I can't remember what the plant was, but you uh, you applied a milk uh, like a raw milk. Um, oh yeah, that was um, it was a nightshade plant. Ink. Nightshade, yeah, deadly night, a uh, black nightshade and yeah. thistles, milk, yeah. Um, taking a leaf tissue test, I think it can be really valuable and it's something we've always done. I compare what is it 
that the, say your grass is in the field, what is, was their leaf tissue and then compare that to your invasive weed. Uh -huh. And um, I don't know if you've, if you've come across Betsy Ross, at the best Betsy Ross grass fed down in Texas. No, I haven't, no. Oh, um, she, I got to do a presentation with her. It was called Sisters of the Soil. I really recommend you go and have a look with okay. uh, Christine well and oh she is just dynamite but they've been um they've been doing pretty much it's almost like we've been living parallel lives like what they've been doing for the last 20 years they make different types of products but based on the leaf testing of mesquite she developed a trace element brew that they've been applying to mesquite um it doesn't kill it straight away but the cambrium just splits and about i saw it three years after she'd sprayed her fields with just a trace element, bit of fulvic acid, some other things. And all of this mesquite was dead. Um, it was wow. truly, truly amazing. And all the grass came away from underneath it. So she's cracked what is actually a pretty massive problem down in Texas, but wow. look her up, she is amazing. I'll definitely check that out. That's, um, yeah. that's fantastic. Um, so I think that it's a, that's a good place to, to uh, stop there, Nicole. Where can folks, and I'll, I'll throw these links down in the, in the show notes and stuff, but where can folks find out yeah. more about the, the work that you do, your book? Uh, what, what other projects have you got going on? Well, today, actually, of all things, um, I released um, a Soil Health Foundation course. So if people were interested in doing that. And the drive behind it is like how to read your soil health like a pro, like it's it's very much around the monitoring side of things. So how do you identify different things? How do you measure it? Mm -hmm. How do you know if your place is getting better or worse, basically? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty fun course. We've had some really good feedback about it. Um, and then otherwise, Integrity Soils, my website. Um, yeah, and I've got lots of YouTube videos. And what I really like people to do would be super cool is if you are interested in getting the book is ask your local bookstore to stock it or um, your and just try and um, support local businesses and, and get the library. Not that people are going to libraries these days. Well, Canada might be different. America's no, pretty great. No, it's <laughs> it's it's pretty bad here. It's it's we're, we just entered a lockdown again yesterday, and yeah. and it's okay, now uh, it's going to the library. Yeah. All right. You can yeah. order it at Amazon. <laughs> but yeah. I just feel like Amazon's the winner out of COVID. Yay. Yeah. They uh, they certainly did. He, he, Bay's also be the first world's first trillionaire, apparently. <laughs> first what? I said uh, Bay's also be the world's first trillionaire, apparently. Oh, how to after uh, yes. after all this, but well, Nick, well, thanks so much for taking time out of your uh, your busy schedule and uh, just for the amazing work that you do. And yeah, I, I hope our our paths Thank you cross for... again sometime soon. I hope so too. And. Gosh, thank you for just such a great review of the book and say hi to the family. And yeah, hopefully I will get over the border again one day. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, take care. All right. Thanks so much, Dakota. See ya.